Hello, this is Dr. James Camp from Lee College in Baytown, Texas, and you're watching Cell Physiology Basics. Today we're going to cover two major aspects of cell physiology, the energy metabolism of cells and the way that cells produce proteins. The first thing we're going to talk about is cell energy metabolism. The basic problem in cell energy metabolism is how to turn the fuel molecules that a cell has to use into as many ATP as possible. You can think of this as being similar to the problem of uh, generating power in our world, that we have fuel sources like natural gas or coal or even uh, solar or wind power, and we have to convert that power into electricity so that we can power our homes and our devices. Similarly, cells have to take their glucose, their fatty acids, uh, any amino acids that they want to use for fuel instead of for proteins, and they need to convert those into as many ATP as possible so that they can fuel, uh, power their cellular machinery. If you're starting with glucose, there is a common first step, no matter how you're going to proceed from here, and that is uh, glycolysis. Glycolysis is the process of breaking glucose. Okay, you can look at that word. Glyco means uh, pro, uh, means glucose or sugar. Lysis is a Greek word meaning to break down. So in the cytoplasm, so anywhere in the cell in the cytoplasm, uh, one glucose molecule can be broken down into two pyruvate molecules. Glucose has six carbons and contains a lot of energy. Pyruvate has three carbons and contains a little less energy. And in the process of, of breaking glucose down into two pyruvates, you also generate two ATP and two of a molecule called NADH that we'll see the importance of later. NADH is what we call uh, an electron carrier. And it can be used... Uh, in something called electron transport chain uh, later in uh, the process. Now, if no oxygen is available to the cell at this point, then we can't uh, oxidize the glucose any further. We can't literally burn the fuel. Um, and so uh, we have to do something with this pyruvate and this NADH so that we can... Uh, get back to uh, the process of burning more, uh, breaking down more glucose. Uh, so each pyruvate and NADH is broken down into a lactate, or combined in a way into a lactate. Uh, that lactate interconverts with a, a molecule called lactic acid, and so this is called lactic acid fermentation. Whenever you use your muscles anaerobically, that is without enough oxygen uh, to burn the fuel completely, you generate lactic acid. And when you use muscles that are not properly conditioned for lactic acid fermentation, uh, you get a feeling that they uh, refer to as lactic acid burn. It's a feeling of, of a kind of burning pain in your muscles because of the buildup of lactic acid. If oxygen is available, however, if, if we're in a high oxygen environment, either because our cardiovascular system is keeping up well with our exercise or because we're not exercising that much right now, we can continue to step two. In step two, uh, step two is referred to as the citric acid cycle. Okay, uh, I should mention that uh, the uh, citric acid cycle and uh, the other third step both happen in the mitochondria. So you remember these little uh, funny organelles with the inner and outer membrane. Uh, there's an inner part of the membrane and that's where the citric acid uh, cycle happens. You, you've got your your citric acid cycle happens here. Uh, 
And what happens is that each, uh, each pyruvate that we made in glycolysis comes in here to the citric acid cycle. Um, this is also where breakdown of fatty acids and breakdown of amino acids come together uh, to, to join the, uh, the energy metabolism parade. Uh, if you want to break down fatty acids, there's a different first step. It's not glycolysis. It's called beta oxidation. If you want to break down amino acids, you have to do what's called deaminating them. You have to take the amino part out of them. Um, and then you, you get this common molecule called acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA starts its way through the citric acid cycle. For each turn through the citric acid cycle, one acetyl-CoA and uh, one leftover CO2 from the pyruvate get turned into three CO2. So we have uh, three CO2 coming out of the mitochondria and eventually having to, to get kicked out of the cell. But we also produce some more of those electron carriers, the NADH, um, and there's another electron carrier called uh, QH2. The Q stands for ubiquitin or quinone. And we, we get one more ATP for each pyruvate. So that's a total of, of two ATP from one glucose that we produce here. We've got two ATP that we've made in the glycolysis. So we're, we're now up to, to four ATP. We've doubled our ATP output. That's a pretty good deal. But what do we do with all of these NADHs and the QH2s and such? There's a third step, which has two different names. Um, they're not two different names for the same thing. They're just two processes that happen together. And this third step is referred to as uh, the electron transport chain and the, uh, the step that goes with it to make all the energy is referred to as oxidative phosphorylation. Okay. Um, oxidative phosphorylation. Um, oxidative because we're using oxygen phosphorylation because we are phosphorylating we're adding a phosphate to ADP to make ATP now this electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation they happen on that inner membrane of the uh, so you have your ETC uh, happens in several different places on the, the membrane of the the inner membrane of the mitochondria and that's why it has its two membranes is so that it has a place for that electron transport chain to go and what happens is your electron carriers like NADH um, give their you know electrons to oxygen um, plus some hydrogens that are floating around um, and you produce you regenerate your empty electron carriers and you also get water as a byproduct. So here uh, we're producing um, water uh, kind of as a waste product. You're, you're generating water, which just goes out into the cell and does what water does in a cell. Um, but uh, as you do this ETC, it powers another uh, process on the cell membrane. It powers something called the oxidative phosphorylation machine. And the oxidative phosphorylation machine is busy turning ATP into AD, ADP into ATP. I'm sorry. It's turning adenosine diphosphate, the low energy form, into adenosine triphosphate, the high energy form. And this produces 32 to 34 ATP per glucose. So that is a huge improvement. We had four, we had two in glycolysis, two in the citric acid cycle. We get 32 to 34 here. 
Okay. So let's look at the net results. Again, we want to start with fuel molecules as, uh, and end with as many ATP as possible. So in cells with not enough oxygen or not enough mitochondria to uh, fully oxidize their fuel, we take glucose and we turn it into two lactic acid, a, a kind of mildly harmful byproduct, and two ATP. Is that good? Well, it's better than nothing, um, and it's fast. That's the other advantage of this, is that in muscles that have to contract quickly before the cardiovascular system can get them enough oxygen, uh, glycolysis happens very quickly, and they can get, uh, they burn a lot of fuel to do it, but they can get a lot of glucose. It's like, uh, it's analogous to a sports car that uh, has, uh, it's analogous to a fancy sports car uh, that has, you know, low miles per gallon, but uh, high speed. Okay. Uh, most of the time we don't choose to do that because our, our body wants more efficiency. It wants to get more ATP out of its glucose. In cells with plenty of oxygen and mitochondria, uh, we do glucose uh, plus six O, you know, for each glucose, we use six O2 in the mitochondria. Uh, and we produce six CO2 from our citric acid cycle and six H2O from our electron transport chain. And now we get uh, 36 to 38 ATP out of, uh, out of our uh, energy. Now here, you know, this is your Toyota Prius uh, with the uh, with the high MPG and kind of a medium speed. Okay, uh, it's not quite as fast as the sports car, but once the uh, cardiovascular system is getting enough oxygen there then it can run for a really long time at high, uh, very high efficiency. Uh, for comparison, um, the sort of, you know, the highest efficiency engines that we produce in, in really high efficiency sports cars produce, get something like 30% of the energy out of our gasoline. Um, doing, uh, the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation gets us something like 60 to 70 percent of the energy out of our our glucose fuel so you can tell your friends that when you're running a marathon you're actually being twice as efficient as uh, the most efficient sports car at uh, running that marathon what kinds of cells would use each of these methods um, again for uh, for cells with not enough oxygen, that's uh, for uh, anaerobic muscles, that's going to be pure glycolysis and lactic acid. Okay, uh, the lactic acid method. For uh, virtually uh, everyone else uh, your aerobic muscles your nervous system that's constantly using energy your heart muscle uh, they're going to want to use the uh, the oxidative method all right, so that sums up what we need to know about cell energy metabolism. Moving on, we're going to move to protein synthesis. Okay, first off, there are a couple of basic ideas you need to know about how protein synthesis works. The first idea is what we call the central dogma of molecular biology. There are two ways of, of stating this, um, or two axioms that are, are considered dogmatic in molecular biology. Uh, now, you may normally associate the word dogma with uh, religion or politics, somebody who has a, a 
firmly held belief that they're not going to change. Well, this is as close as we get to a firmly held and unchanging belief in biology. The first central dogma is that a DNA is that DNA makes RNA and RNA makes protein or is used to make protein. So we have a DNA structure called a gene. These genes are found in your in your chromosomes in your DNA in your uh, in your nucleus. Uh, they are copied to make RNA and uh, the RNA that is copied from a DNA gene is called a message. And that message carries uh, is carried to a protein and uh, and this little machine called a uh, this little machine called a ribosome is used to read the RNA and build a protein from that RNA recipe. The other central dogma is that one gene equals one protein. It's not exactly true because some proteins have multiple subunits that are coded from a couple of different genes. But the idea is that um, one gene will never make more than one protein. And usually it's only one or two genes that are needed to make one particular protein. So uh, basically a gene uh, is a recipe for a protein. So you can think of it as the gene uh, is the recipe or the blueprint, depending on how you want to think about this, for, for cooking or manufacturing a protein. Why does this protein synthesis business matter to a cell? The answer is that one protein, uh, in most cases, equals one function. Okay, so you might have a protein that serves as a pump to move things in or out of the cell or as a gateway to allow things to move in and out of the cell. You might have a different protein that acts as an anchor to keep the cell in place. Uh, you might have one protein in a liver cell that stores glucose as glycogen and another protein that releases glycose, uh, releases glucose from glycogen uh, to, to fuel the body. Each of those functions requires its own protein or sometimes a group of proteins to do them. So we can say uh, without much exaggeration that everything a cell does is done by a protein. Therefore, it is critically important for a cell to be able to make the right set of proteins to do all of their jobs. Okay, we're gonna talk about how this works and we're also going to talk about where each thing happens. In the nucleus, DNA is transcribed to make mRNA, that's messenger RNA. There are three kinds of RNA, mRNA is one of them. The DNA gene is read by a molecule called RNA polymerase, uh, an enzyme complex, that matches one base pair of a DNA to one base pair of the mRNA to make an exact mRNA copy of the DNA. Okay, this is kind of like uh, if you want to think about it this way, DNA recipes live in, are kept on reserve in the nuclear library. And so, you know, if you have a book that's on reserve in the library and you want to be able to use it outside the library, you have to make a copy. So the mRNA message is basically uh, the, the molecular equivalent of a photocopy of a DNA gene. It's the same language. Um, we use ACGT in DNA and ACGU in RNA, but it's basically the same language. So we call this transcription. Okay, where that word comes from, if, if you took some notes about this lecture and I wanted to have an exact copy of, of your notes, I would transcribe them into my notebook. So that's where we get that word. At the ribosome, the mRNA is translated into a polypeptide, okay? The ribosome reads the mRNA message uh, three letters at a time. So uh, you might have uh, A, C, G would equal one particular 
uh, amino acid, um, whereas ATG might equal a different amino acid. So the ribosome reads the genetic code to determine the correct sequence of amino acids. So it'll read ACG and it'll pop in that amino acid. Then it'll read uh, TAG and it'll put in a different amino acid next. And it'll keep reading until it reaches the end of the, the message. And as it goes, it builds uh, one amino acid to another amino acid to another amino acid. And because each of these bonds between amino acids is called a peptide bond, the whole thing is called a polypeptide chain. Why don't we call it a protein yet? Because the protein is the finished uh, product and we're not quite there yet. We're just, we're producing the polypeptide chain that will become the protein. Now, in this case, we're using different languages. Um, we're, we start with the ACGT language of DNA or RNA, um, and we're, we're working uh, into the 20 amino acid language of uh, peptide chains. So we call this translation. Okay, again, if, if you had taken notes on this lecture in English and I wanted to make notes in Spanish for a Spanish speaking student in my class, I would have to translate your notes from one language to another. And that's why we call this translation, is we're translating from the DNA language to the protein language. Okay, so in the nucleus, we transcribed DNA into mRNA. At the ribosome, we translated mRNA into a polypeptide. There are two options to proceed from here. In option A, um, we made our polypeptide in a free or unbound ribosome. We have ribosomes that are just scattered around the cytoplasm, boop, 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 um, and each one is just going to drop its, its polypeptide chain into the cytoplasm, and it's going to fold itself into a protein, um, and then that protein can go off to wherever it's needed in the cell to do its work. This is typically used for relatively simple proteins that are not, they don't need what we call post-processing. They don't need to be uh, modified or specially folded or assembled in certain ways. Um, and it's used for proteins that can do their job anywhere in the cell. They don't need to be specially transported to a particular place. If there's an option A, of course, there's going to be an option B. And the option B is that we have um, ribosomes on the uh, the rough ER. So we've got this membrane here called rough ER, and it's got little ribosomes dotting it here, there, and around. Um, and what they do is that they spit their polypeptides out into the lumen of the ER. The, the lumen of uh, a biological space is, is the inside part of that organelle or organ. And in that place, the, the polypeptide is post-processed. It may need to be folded a particular way. Um, it may need to be modified, have you know additions or subtractions made to it. Um, it may need to come together with other subunits. And eventually, we get something like the finished protein out of that. In option B, typically, we then continue to uh, another organelle called the Golgi apparatus. You may remember that, and it's the one that looks sort of like a stack of pancakes somewhere in your cell. Um, and our protein is going to go, it's going to get in a transport vesicle and be carried to the rough ER, uh, to the Golgi apparatus, from the rough ER to the Golgi apparatus. Um, and in the Golgi apparatus, it's going to be finished. Um, there may be some further modification steps we need to do. It's going to be sorted um, and prepared for shipping. So um, these proteins that are made in the rough ER often have a, uh, essentially, a, they have a tag on them that's essentially the protein version of a shipping label. And so they're sorted by where they're supposed to go. And then uh, they may get moved over here and they get 
moved over here, and then we have we get put in another vesicle, okay? And the protein is now carried by a vesicle to one of three places. It can go to a particular spot inside the cell. It can go to the cell membrane itself. Maybe it's one of those cell membrane channel proteins. Um, or uh, it can go outside the cell. Uh, and in that case, we say that the protein is secreted. Uh, it is secreted outside the cell. Um, an example of this would be if you were a fibroblast who's making collagen in a tissue, uh, you, you need to make the collagen inside the cell, but you need to secrete it outside the cell. Or if you're a pancreas cell that's trying to make the hormone insulin, you need to secrete it outside the cell for it to be able to do its job. Okay. So in summary, we have basically four steps to making a, a full finished protein. Uh, a DNA gene is used to make an mRNA message. That happens in the nucleus. The mRNA message is used to make a polypeptide chain. Uh, that happens in the ribosome. The finished polypeptide chain is uh, then uh, folded and possibly post-processed into a finished protein. Uh, that can happen in the cytoplasm or it can happen in the lumen of the rough ER for more complicated proteins. Uh, if we were at the cytoplasm, then um, we, we stop there. Uh, that there's, there's no need for further processing. If we were in the lumen of the rough ER, we then hop on board a transport vesicle and go to the Golgi apparatus. Uh, so we always start in the nucleus. Uh, the mRNA message always goes to the ribosome. Uh, but then from the ribosome, we have the option of going to the cytoplasm or of going to the lumen of the rough ER. And in the cytoplasm, you know, we're done. Stop. We're, we've got a finished protein. If we're in the lumen of the rough ER, we're going to hop on board a vesicle, go to the Golgi apparatus, hop on board another vesicle, and go to uh, the final destination. All right. And that has been my overview of cellular physiology. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for your attention, and happy studying.